morning, welcome. This is the uh, 2014 Woolhouse Lecture where we recognize the outstanding contribution of a senior scientist in experimental plant biology. My name is Tony Farrell and as president of the society I'm absolutely de delighted to introduce Professor George Kuplan who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding in Cologne, Germany. We're recognizing today Professor Kuplan's stellar contributions to the understanding of the mechanisms that induce and control flowering. As a recognition of these, he's a member of the Royal Society and the National Academy of Science, which is an amazing achievement. Professor George Copeland. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for the welcome, and thank you, uh, Tony, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here at the SEB after quite a few years, but it's also a pleasure to give the Harold Woolhouse Lecture because I guess I might be the last generation of speaker who actually remembers Harold. And in fact, he hired me, gave me my first uh, permanent job at the John Innes uh, Institute, which he transformed into uh, you know, a fantastic center for doing plant science where I actually worked for 12 years. <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to be here to give the Woolhouse Lecture. And actually, since those days when uh, Harold hired me at the John Innes, we've been interested in the seasonal control of plant development. So how plants detect seasonal change and use it to control uh, developmental programs. And this is a, an iconic example, which is a deciduous tree where uh, the buds, uh, bud break and bud dormancy are all controlled by seasonal uh, responses so that the life cycle of the plant is synchronized to the changing seasons. We've been using a much more uh, experimentally tractable system, which is the model uh, plant Arabidopsis thaliana, but it still shows very clear and uh, robust responses to seasonal change. So the plant germinates uh, in the autumn, as shown here, these winter annual accessions. It then grows vegetatively through the winter when it will not flower, and then it flowers in the spring in response to long days and in response to these uh, low temperatures that the plant's exposed in winter. So you have this uh, combination of low temperatures from winter and long days from spring combining to uh, induce the program that's going to allow flowers to develop. And then as Arabidopsis is an annual plant, all of the meristems, all of the groups of stem cells on the shoot, they're going to give rise to flowers and ultimately to seeds. And then the whole plant senesces and the life cycle continues through seed. So here you see that the whole uh, life cycle of the plant is contained within a single year. And you have these uh, robust changes to uh, seasons in between. Now, it's very clear in uh, natural environments that actually many plants don't behave quite like Arabidopsis does. They're not annuals. They don't just uh, live for one year and give rise to seeds. This is a community of plants that was actually painted over 500 years ago by uh, Durer, growing in their natural environment. And actually, all of these species are perennials. So they don't just live for a single year, flower, and then give rise to seed. But they live for many years, and they have to respond to the seasonal change each year. It turns out that this difference between annual and perennial actually can evolve very quickly within uh, phylogenies of flowering plants. And in fact, many of the relatives of Arabidopsis thaliana are perennial. So they show some of the same responses as uh, Arabidopsis, the annual, in the sense that they flower in spring after they've been exposed to winter conditions and when they're exposed to long days. But then, instead of just uh, flowering from all meristems and giving rise to seeds and dying, the plant restricts the amount of flowering it does to certain branches, reverts to vegetative growth, and then will grow vegetatively again indefinitely until it's exposed to winter conditions. And you can grow these plants in the glasshouse through these cycles for many years. And in fact, even in their natural environment, this species of Rabis alpina, which we've developed as a model for this uh, perennial life cycle, will grow for five, 10 years in its natural environment if you follow individual plants. So we've become interested then in how these seasonal responses that we've defined in Arabidopsis how they're modified in perennial plants to control particular aspects of the perennial cycle, which we'll come to in a moment. 
Now, this uh, difference seems to be a selective, there are selective pressures which drive the evolution of annualism. And in, partic in particular environments where seasonal fluctuations in uh, water availability, for example, are extremely strong. So there's drought, plants are exposed to severe drought in the, in the summer. You will have strong uh, selection for annualism where the plant then flowers, produces seed and continues to uh, the life cycle through seed. Whereas perennials tend to live in more constant environments and then can live indefinitely as a perennial. They can live through the whole season and they don't get exposed to this, uh, all of the seasons, and they don't get exposed to this uh, severe uh, environmental pressure that's going to induce the evolution of annualism. So for this type of comparative approach that we are uh, doing them between species closely related to Arabidopsis, there are certain uh, advantages at the moment based on uh, where the field is. So one is that we can build upon uh, the work that has been done by systematicists over several decades to build a phylogeny of the Brassicaceae in which Arabidopsis resides and in which we can place all of its relatives. And this is one that we made uh, in detail around Arabis alpina, our model perennial. And we see here that we've uh, defined whether all of the plants in this uh, phylogeny are annual or perennial. And we see that we have Arabis alpina as a perennial in this group here, and then a very closely related annual, Arabis montbretziana, in a small group here. So the ones are annuals. And then on this branch, another perennial. So it suggests to us that the progenitor of this whole group was likely a perennial. It gave rise to this perennial, Nordmaniana, and it gave rise to this group of uh, perennials, including Arabis alpina. And in that case, the annual life cycle of Arabis montbretziana, this relative, is derived. So the annual evolves from the perennial progenitor. And you can see here that this has actually happened several times within this phylogeny. So it's something that can happen repeatedly and independently, even among closely related species. And we see the same for Arabis, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, the model species, which is clustered in a genus surrounded by uh, perennials. So then this becomes a problem of how annuals evolve from perennial progenitors. The other advantage is that we can actually sequence the genome of effectively all of these species within this uh, phylogeny. And this shows the genome of uh, Arabis alpina, which we sequenced in a small uh, consortium. It has eight chromosomes, which are typical for, that, uh, for this family, the Brassicaceae. Arabidopsis is very derived with only five. And this diagram shows how the chromosomes of Arabis alpina are related to those of Arabidopsis thaliana. And we've also sequenced the, the genome of uh, Arabis montbretziana, the, an, the annual which is very closely related to alpina. One of the things that we see is that in general, when annuals evolve, the genome becomes much smaller. So in the case of Arabis montbretziana, the genome is around 100 megabases smaller than that of uh, Arabis alpina. And it's very similar with Arabidopsis thaliana, where the genome is again around 100 megabases smaller than its closest perennial relative, Arabidopsis lyrata. So it seems that in this uh, selective pressure to evolve annualism from perennialism, the genome reduces in size. And that is in part due to a lot of loss of repeated sequences, but may also be due to uh, the loss of genes or the change of gene complement. And by sequencing the genomes of plants within this phylogeny, we hope to be able to compare the genome complement between independent uh, evolutionary trajectories leading towards annualism. So compare different annual perennial sisters in different parts of the uh, phylogeny. The other thing that makes this sort of approach very uh, timely is that we can now do reverse genetics in essentially any species in this group using uh, the Cas9 nuclease chromosome engineering approach. And now several groups have published this approach, but it just shows the one that we are using in, uh, in our lab in Arabidopsis, but can easily be applied to uh, other species which are all transformable. So this drives a Cas9 expression from a promoter that's expressed very early during the embryo of the growing plant. And then it generates this uh, nuclease, which is guided to a target site by an RNA. And that then cleaves the DNA, leading to uh, a double-strand break, which, when it's repaired, induces mutations at that site. This turns out to be a very efficient approach in uh, 
Arabidopsis, where if we drive expression of Cas9 in the embryo, we then generate uh, T1 plants, which are already show mutant phenotypes because they carry mutant alleles on both chromosomes uh, in some cases. And then in the progeny, we see segregation of the mutant phenotype and we can isolate stable alleles. So this effectively makes uh, reverse genetics then possible in all of these non-model species by using this uh, Cas9 system to induce mutations in gene genes of interest. So as we come to the perennial, let's talk first about what we know in uh, Arabidopsis thaliana about how plants detect and uh, respond to seasonal change. So there are effectively two pathways which detect seasons and uh, contribute to the induction of flowering. One is uh, the day length pathway, which is shown here, and the other is the vernalization or winter temperature pathway, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. So in this day length pathway then, in a central position, we have the constant transcription factor, which is a zinc finger transcription factor. This is transcriptionally regulated by the circadian clock and post-translationally regulated by light. So that in long day conditions, which are gonna induce flowering, the protein accumulates, which is shown here. Whereas in short day conditions, the protein accumulates to a much lesser extent. And this means that uh, it activates its downstream target FT to which the constant uh, protein will bind much more effectively under long day conditions. The FT protein is a small protein closely related to lipid binding proteins of animals. It's expressed like CO in the vascular tissue of the leaf, in fact, in the phloem companion cells. And then this FT protein can move through the vascular tissue to the shoot apical meristem as we showed uh, several years ago, and it was also showed by several other groups, including Phil Wiggs. And then in the shoot apical meristem, FT interacts with a class of transcription factors, probably a small family of transcription factors, BZIP transcription factors, and the heterodimer, including FT and FD, activates downstream genes, which leads to a transcriptional cascade in the shoot apical meristem, ultimately resulting in uh, floral development. And we have an increasing understanding of the, you know, the sophistication of the transcriptional network in the shoot apical meristem, although I'm not gonna talk about that today. So that in a nutshell is the photoperiod pathway in Arabidopsis thaliana through stabilization of constants, activating FT and inducing flowering of the shoot apical meristem. Winter temperature is detected by a, an independent pathway that acts through a distinct transcription factor called FLC. This is a Madsbox transcription factor. This is a repressor of transcription, which binds directly to the FT gene and represses its transcription, but it also binds to several genes in the shoot apical meristem and prevents their expression. When the plant's exposed to winter temperatures, this gene becomes epigenetically modified. The histones on the gene become trimethylated on lysine 27. And progressively during uh, winter, FLC transcription is repressed so that uh, this repressor disappears from this uh, network and FT and constants can then activate flowering. <clears throat> so basically we have two pathways. One uh, detects winter temperature through repression of FLC the other activates flowering in response to long days through activation of FT transcription and uh, movement of FT protein to the shoot metastem. Now with those pathways in mind, we come to uh, the differences between the perennial species, which is related to uh, Arabidopsis and the annual Arabidopsis thaliana. So here we're looking for flowering traits that we think have evolved as the plant has moved from perennial to annual. And there are two distinct traits that I'm gonna to describe today and how we've approached trying to figure out how they're controlled in the perennial. One is uh, the age at which the plant becomes sensitive to respond to environment. So generally annuals like Arabidopsis thaliana, they will respond to uh, winter temperatures or indeed day length from a very early age, within a day or two of germination. And then they, uh, when they're exposed to appropriate conditions, they induce flowering and flower. However, perennials are uh, quite distinct. They will grow for several weeks, in some cases years, before they become sensitive to the environmental cue. And in Arabis alpina, then, as we'll see in a moment, it needs five or six weeks growth under normal conditions before it becomes sensitive to winter temperatures. And if it's exposed to winter temperatures earlier, it simply does not flower. <clears throat> 
So we're interested in this age-related uh, difference. How is it that perennials need to be several weeks old before they respond to environment, whereas annuals can do it within a few days of germination? And the other thing is that <clears throat> perennials, because they uh, only flower for a short period of time and then revert back to vegetative growth, they have a part, they have a step in their life history, which is totally missing in annuals. Annuals only flower once in their life cycle, and then they senesce and die. Perennials flower, and then they revert back to vegetative growth, and they grow vegetatively until they're exposed to environmental conditions again. So we're interested in what causes this reversion back from flowering back to vegetative growth, and how that defines the duration of flowering in a perennial, for exactly how long the plant flowers before going back to vegetative growth. So this illustrates the, the process. This is the flowering of Arabisulpina in vernalization. And we're following expression of a gene that's expressed specifically in floral primordia. This is weeks in uh, winter temperatures, vernalization. So the plant's eight weeks old before it's exposed to winter temperatures. It then placed in winter temperatures. And within six to eight weeks, you can see the expression of genes that are specifically expressed in the floral primordium and the development of flowers on the flanks of the shoot apical meristem. So basically, this plant undergoes the floral transition in low temperatures while it's being vernalized. Now, this is an eight-week-old plant. If that uh, same treatment is given to a three-week-old plant, then it's essentially, in terms of flowering, insensitive to the treatment. You don't see any floral development on the shoot apex. So there's here an age-related effect that prevents the three-week-old plant from responding, whereas the eight-week-old plant could. And in fact, this, uh, this age-related effect is not only relevant for plants of different ages, but it plays out on the shoot of each individual plant. So here is a plant that was uh, eight weeks old when it was exposed to low temperatures. The shoot apical meristem has flowered, and here we have flowers developing on the flanks. But these auxiliary meristems, they're too young to respond to the winter temperature. They stay vegetative. And after the plant has returned to normal growth temperatures to spring, these are going to grow out as vegetative shoots. And this provides the biomass, the vegetative tissue, which is going to respond to uh, winter the following year. So this age-related effect is relevant not only at the level of individual plants, but it's relevant at the behavior of uh, meristems on an individual uh, plant. Okay, so then we come to how we actually approach this, because here we're working on a non-model plant, a perennial, and we need to find a way of uh, approaching how it controls flowering and these perennial-specific traits. And what we did, first of all, was to take an accession of uh, Arabis alpina, which we were actually isolated from Spain, and we made a homozygous line, so all of the plants are identical, was self-fertilized self six times to make a completely homozygous line. And then we mutagenized it with the mutagen EMS. And here we're screening 20,000 plants in a greenhouse. Now these plants, I mean, this looks a rather daunting uh, glass house full of plants, but in fact, these never flower unless they're exposed to winter temperatures. So what we can do is simply to walk through this glass house and look for any flowering plant, and then it must be a mutant. And that's effectively how we, uh, we first found a way into this uh, flowering behavior to generate genetic variation in Arabis alpina. And we found two mutant mutations. So we found uh, mutations at two loci and many alleles at each. And I'm going to talk today only about perpetual flowering one. But they both have the same phenotype, although they're at different genes. And this plant flowers in the absence of uh, vernalization. So this is the mutant. It flowers without vernalization, unlike the wild type. And this is actually the phenotype we screened for. And it's a phenotype you can also recover in annuals. But it really shows two phenotypes that are also then specific to perennials. One is that when it undergoes the transition to flowering, the wild type reverts back to vegetative growth, as we saw before. But in this case, the perennial, uh, sorry, the mutant, when it flowers, continues to flower indefinitely. So we've actually here inactivated this ability of the plant to limit the duration of flowering so that it will flower uh, constantly after it undergoes the uh, induction of flowering. <clears throat> 
And the other thing is that now all the branches undergo the transition to flowering, not just uh, the main shoot, as happened in uh, the wild type. So this is a repressor of flowering that regulates a vernalization response, but it also regulates the duration of flowering and the number of branches that undergo the transition. Now, we were able to clone this gene basically using a candidate uh, approach based on what we knew from Arabidopsis thaliana. And it turned out that the first mutant we described, PEP1, was a mutation in the Madsbox transcription factor, FLC, which we know is involved in the regulation of vernalization response in Arabidopsis. But of course, in the perennial, it's contributing other responses. It's limiting the duration of flowering and it's limiting the number of shoots that undergo the transition. And the key to this difference is to understand that in Arabidopsis, when the gene is repressed during vernalization, it's stably repressed by epigenetic modifications on the histones of the gene. So trimethylysine 27 on histone 3 represses FLC expression during uh, vernalization. And then when the plant returns to normal growth temperatures, FLC expression is stably repressed. And that allows the whole plant to undergo the transition to flowering from all meristems. So this uh, epigenetic repression of FLC during vernalization in the annual is stable after vernalization, allowing this repressor to stay off and allowing the whole plant to flower. And what we found is that in the perennial, this pattern of regulation is different. And the expression of the gene is not stably repressed during vernalization. Rather, it's, uh, it more or less responds directly to temperature. So it's expressed before the plant is exposed to low temperatures in the shoot apical meristem here. And then when the plant's put in low temperatures, the expression of the gene falls so that it's not expressed to the shoot apical meristem or in the axillaries. But when it comes out after vernalization, the expression of the gene rises again. And that blocks flowering in any shoot which didn't actually flower during vernalization. So in these young axillary meristems, which were too young to undergo the transition in vernalization, they're not going to flower after vernalization because FLC expression rises again in the axillary meristem and blocks flowering. And uh, we know, of course, that this does block flowering in this meristem because in the mutant it will flower, whereas in the wild type it does not. So then one of the ways in which this system is a uh, evolving, if you like, is by changing the regulation of uh, this FLC gene, this key gene that regulates uh, vernalization response. So that in uh, Arabidopsis, it's modified during vernalization, and then its transcription is stably repressed after vernalization by accumulation of this mark on the gene. And that allows the whole plant to flower in the annual case. But in the perennial, you see the cycling in expression, because this epigenetic mark seems to be unstable. After vernalization, it disappears from the gene, whereas it persists on the gene in the annual. This correlates with this increase in expression, and that limits the duration of flowering when this repressor rises again after vernalization. Now, we were interested then in whether this is an important trait in nature. Is this cycling expression of FLC, which then limits the duration of flowering, can we find variation for that in natural populations? And does it then contribute to the, if you like, the fitness of different accessions in different environments? And Arabis alpina has a wide uh, range, which we see here. So this is from uh, northern Spain all the way to northern Sweden, and in these uh, alpine type environments. And we have been to many of these environments, and we've collected plants from different populations, which are then defined. And this is the Pindos Gorge in uh, Greece, where we went collecting. Alpina was growing all the way along here. This is my son, who at that stage was still young enough not to be too embarrassed to join us on this type of excursion. I mean, he wouldn't, I don't think he would join us these days. And uh, so this is an example then of where uh, Arabis Alpina grows in its natural environment. So we quickly found that in many of these populations, you can find plants that actually behave in a very similar way to the PEP1 mutant. So they flower early in the absence of vernalization, and they flower indefinitely once they undergo the transition. So this uh, 
much longer duration of flowering that we see in the PEP1 mutant. It's not restricted to the induced mutation. You can actually find natural populations where this type of plant exists. And we were able to show by uh, genetic crossing between several of these accessions in our mutant that they actually do carry mutant alleles in the PEP1 gene. So they do not complement the PEP1 mutation. And in fact, by uh, then sequencing the gene, or in this case, performing Western blots with an antibody that we raised against the PEP1 protein, we could show that actually in each of these different populations, there are different alleles of the PEP1 gene. So it has, this mutation has arisen independently in many different populations. And so here we see the PEP1 protein in our uh, control accession, which is, disappears on vernalization and it disappears in the PEP1 mutant. In this accession, the protein is truncated due to an internal deletion. In this one, it's completely missing. And in these two, they carry uh, missense mutations that inactivate the protein in the DNA binding domain. So these independent mutations arise in nature in different populations, and they seem to arise quite uh, often. Now, if we look at the distribution of these mutations, we were initially really surprised because what we find is that the mutations, so here we have the, the key to understand this, plants that never flower, so have a very strong vernalization requirement, a very strong PEP1 allele are marked in red. Those that flower without vernalization, so naturally occurring PEP1 alleles are marked in yellow, the mutant alleles. Populations that are both type are like this. So you can see here that we find uh, both types of allele. So the mutant alleles actually in very extreme environments, right up to the very north of Sweden, where you might actually think a response to winter temperatures is going to be most important. And you also find uh, in the Alps at very high altitude where our uh, populations are growing. But in the most southerly location in Spain, all of these populations are very strong vernalization requiring and all have very strong PEP1 alleles. So actually, although this mutation arises very frequently in these populations, apparently independently, it never arises in these Spanish populations. We've looked at literally uh, thousands of plants across many populations. And our uh, rationalization for that is that actually what is important, what is selecting for an active PEP1 gene in uh, Spain is not the response to winter temperatures, but it's actually limiting the duration of flowering. So this is a a sensor, a temperature sensor that we used in our natural populations. This is the Swedish population. The temperature is only above freezing for three months of the year. So the growing season is extremely short. Whereas in the Spanish population, the growing season is uh, around eight months. So we think that this active PEP1 allele is very important in the Spanish population because it actually ensures that the plant doesn't flower all the way through this uh, long growing season right through the summer months, which then might be detrimental to its, uh, well, growth and survival. Whereas in the, in the northern accessions or at high altitude, this is much less important because uh, the growing season is already very short and it can essentially be driven directly by a response to environment. So our rationalization then is that uh, the active PEP1 gene, which restricts the length of flowering, is particularly important in the southern populations where the growing season is much longer and is less important in the high altitude or northern accessions where the winters are more extreme, but the growing season is much shorter. Okay, then I would like to come to the second uh, trait that we uh, defined at the beginning, which is peculiar to perennials and we don't see in uh, annuals, and that's this age-related response to environment or uh, competence to flower, acquisition of competence. So in Arabis alpina, we can grow plants, we need to grow plants for five or six weeks before we expose them to vernalization, and then 100% of plants will flower. But if we expose younger plants to vernalization, they don't respond at all. And this is not to do with regulation of the Madsbox transcription factor PEP1, so the protein that we've been talking about so far. Because we can show here that in plants of uh, any age, PEP1 expression falls when they're exposed to vernalization, but the plant still doesn't flower if it's too young to respond. 
So this is a step, this age-related step is af acting after the down regulation of uh, PET1 to prevent flowering of young plants. And the way that we approached this was actually to, we used a custom array that we built based on the Arabis alpina genome to do transcription profiling. And we looked for genes that were expressed specifically in older apices and not in younger apices. So here we took uh, RNA then from apices of eight week old plants or two week old plants that had not been exposed to vernalization and compared them. What we can see here is that we have a class of uh, transcription factor, this SPL transcription factor that are expressed in the apices of uh, old plants but are not expressed in the apices of young plants. And then we have another class of SPLs that come on in vernalized old plants but not in vernalized young plants. So these were candidates to us for being involved in this competence response because it had been shown by uh, Scott Potek's group, for example, that these SPLs have an important role in vegetative phase change in some vegetative characters on the shoot that uh, regulate the development of leaves, for example, in an age-related way. And they'd also been shown to be involved, some members of the family, in flowering in Arabidopsis thaliana. So we, so one thing I should say is that actually this class of uh, SPL transcription factor is also targeted by a microRNA, which is called microRNA-156. And microRNA-156 represses the activity of these SPL transcription factors. So then what we found is that uh, microRNA-156 falls in expression as the plant ages. It falls in expression in the shoot apex as the plant ages. And uh, some of these SPL transcription factors show exactly the complementary effect rising in expression as the, SPL go as the microRNA goes down. And the point at which they reach uh, trough levels, which is five weeks after germination here, is exactly the point at which correlates with the point at which the plant becomes uh, competent to respond to vernalization. So it suggested then that uh, this microRNA-156 must fall to trough levels before the plant can become susceptible to uh, vernalization. And this is to do with upregulation of its cognate transcription factors. So there are other ways in which you can correlate microRNA-156 to this ability to respond to vernalization. One is uh, just measuring it in different parts of the plant. So if we follow microRNA-156 levels in auxiliary shoots, which as we saw later become competent to respond to vernalization at a slightly different time than the main shoot, we can see that the down regulation of microRNA-156 is shifted in comparison to the main shoot, it's shifted later, but it correlates with the time at which the auxiliary shoot becomes susceptible to respond to vernalization. So it's now eight weeks rather than five weeks. And that correlates with the downregulation of microRNA-156. So this timer, this downregulation of the microRNA, it's occurring independently in the different uh, branches of the plant and determining when they become susceptible to uh, vernalization. The other thing we noticed is that uh, if we take a two-week-old plant which still has very high levels of microRNA-156, and transfer it into vernalization, it will not flower. But although the plant continues to grow there, albeit slowly, microRNA-156 levels stay very high. So it seems like vernalization is acting to inhibit the down-regulation of the microRNA, and if you like, stop this timer, which is measuring the age of the plant. Uh, <clears throat> But as soon as the plants return to normal growth temperatures, microRNA-156 falls very rapidly. And then if those plants are exposed to vernalization a second time, they will now flower. So again, you see a perfect correlation between the level of the microRNA and the susceptibility to respond to vernalization. So we then uh, tested this correlation in transgenic plants by either overexpressing the microRNA or by reducing its activity using a mimicry construct. And now we're in Arabis alpina overexpressing the microRNA so that it's no longer downregulated by age. And uh, this represses SPL expression and the plants actually never flower, <clears throat> even if they're exposed to vernalization. So these SPL transcription factors in the context of the perennial Arabis alpina seem to be essential for flowering to occur so that if you prevent their expression by overexpressing the microRNA, the plant never flowers.
And then we can use this mimicry construct, which actually binds, so it's complementary to the microRNA. If expressed in the plants, it binds the microRNA and prevents the microRNA from interacting with its cognate uh, messenger RNA. So effectively, what this does is to reduce the activity of the microRNA in the plant. And if we do that, we get increased expression of SPLs, as we'd expect, because they are normally repressed by the microRNA. These plants don't flower unless they're exposed to vernalization. But now if they're exposed to vernalization at a younger age, they will flower. So here's a plant, here's a plant that were only three weeks old, exposed to vernalization, and almost 100% of the plants exposed to vernalization flower in the transgenics, but none in the wild type. So this really supports the idea that this microRNA is a timer for age. It determines the time at which the plant is going to become susceptible to vernalization and then flower. And that it's the downregulation of the microRNA that determines uh, when the plant is going to be competent to respond to the vernalization signal. Now I should say this, yeah, well, we'll, we'll go on, we'll come back to that. So then we have two independent pathways then, one controlled by vernalization, two repressive pathways. One that's going to downregulate uh, PEP1 and allow the plant to respond to vernalization, and one which is age-related and is going to downregulate microRNA 156 and allow the SPLs to rise. And both of these conditions need to be satisfied before the plant will flower, so that young plants exposed to vernalization don't flower because the microRNA is high, and old plants not exposed to vernalization don't flower because PEP1 expression is high. And we have an unexpected link between vernalization and competence in that uh, in low temperatures, vernalization prevents the downregulation of the microRNA. Now this intersection between uh, low temperatures and this aging pathway became also clear when we did this uh, comparative CHIPSEC experiment. And I think it's one of the interesting things that we can now do with uh, Arabis alpina, where we have these mutants. We have mutants and wild type of orthologous transcription factors in two distinct species. And we have antibodies raised against both. So we can basically do a chip sec, we can bind, uh, cross-link the transcription factors to DNA, precipitate the DNA to which the transcription factor is bound, and then sequence it in both species. And what we find is a certain number of targets, so a few hundred in each case. And I think the Arabidopsis targets are very robust. The Arabis alpina targets, probably, we're still working on them. But there's an overlap of around 15% of genes that are common between both species. We think these are the core targets of FLC, or PEP1, that are involved in flowering time control. And some of these are involved in flowering. So really, genes that we already knew about that are regulated in the meristem by uh, FLC are bound in both species directly. You can actually map very nice binding site regions in the promoter, which are often within these conserved regulatory modules, which are broader than just the binding site itself, suggesting that actually it's binding there with a cluster of other uh, transcription factors in both species. But what struck us about this list is that one of them is actually an SPL transcription factor that is also regulated by the microRNA. And in fact, this, uh, which is SPL15, is uh, bound in Arabis alpina by SPL15. So we can do, sorry, by PEP1. So SPL15 is bound by PEP1 if we do chip PCR. It increases in expression in the mutant compared to the wild type. So PEP1 doesn't only bind to this gene, but it regulates its transcription. And in fact, it rises in the shoot apical meristem during vernalization of an old plant, but not uh, a young plant. So we think that this single transcription factor might be one of the major targets that's involved in uh, regulating uh, flowering downstream of microRNA 156. We would like to analyze its ex activity by reverse genetics in Arabis alpina, which we haven't done yet, but we have done it in Arabidopsis thaliana where the SPLs have a much reduced phenotype, but they cause delayed flowering under short days. And if we overexpress microRNA 156 or knock out SPL 15, we get a very similar phenotype, suggesting that actually most of the regulation of flowering through microRNA 156 is going through this single transcription factor, SPL 15, which is also a target for FLC and PEP1. And in fact, if we mutate the microRNA binding site in SPL15, so this is SPL15, the genomic locus fused to a fluorescent protein, 
and then expressed in uh, Arabidopsis, you can see it causes early flowering in comparison to the wild type, telling us that actually the microRNA is repressing SPL15 activity to delay flowering in Arabidopsis. So we think then that these uh, two pathways, the vernalization pathway and the competence pathway, one acting through microRNA156 and one acting through PEP1, they actually converge on a single SPL15 transcription factor, which is involved in the promotion of flowering, at least in Arabidopsis. And this is regulated transcriptionally by PEP1 and post-transcriptionally by the microRNA156. Okay, so then I just want to come in the last part to uh, the evolution of the difference between annual and perennial. And we come back to this phylogeny because by using these genetic or molecular genetic approaches, we can identify genes that we think have important functions in the annual or the perennial. But what we would really like to understand also is how it evolves. So what are the genes that actually change when you evolve an annual from a perennial progenitor? And... Uh, this is just to remind you of the phylogeny. We have an annual uh, Arabis montbretziana and we have the perennial Arabis alpina directly adjacent to each other in the phylogeny. And montbretziana does not show this age-related effect that we see in the perennial. So it still has the microRNA and the microRNA falls with age, but now the plant will respond to vernalization at uh, any age, even straight from germination. So we... Um, um, take this to mean that during the evolution of annualism in Arabis mumbretziana, it's evolved a bypass pathway that allows it to flower even if the microRNA level is high and the SPLs are low. So during the evolution of annualism, this bypass has evolved that allows uh, the annual mumbretziana to respond to vernalization when it's young. And that's also true for uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. So it seems to have occurred independently twice in the evolution of annualism. Now, what's really nice in the Arabis case is that we can intercross the annual and perennial. And this took some time to do, but because the two species are so closely related and they have similar chromosome numbers, we can actually cross the annual and perennial and generate uh, hybrids, which are shown here. And these hybrids are uh, diploid, so they have one chromosome, each chromosome from each of the parents, and they can be back crossed to Arabis alpina. So we can use this material to introgress segments of the annual genome into the perennial and then ask what is the phenotypic effect of the annual, that segment of the annual genome in the perennial. And now because we have the genome of uh, both species, we've been able to do uh, genotyping by sequencing on this material. And these are the eight chromosomes of the hybrids. And these are different families that are derived by uh, backcrossing. The yellow is the Arabis alpina genome. The black is heterozygous for Montbretziana, and the red is homozygous for annual Montbretziana. So what you can see here is that as you come down the chromosomes and just scan across this relatively limited number of families, almost all of the Montbretziana genome has been introgressed in at least one family into the alpina genome. And this is scored with uh, 20,000 markers, so we're at high uh, resolution here. So we can then take these families and ask whether we see phenotypes that are associated with the annual. Have we been able to introgress into the perennial an annual trait that we can then isolate the gene that's uh, causing the effect? And this just shows that some of these families actually now respond to uh, vernalization at a young age, which is a characteristic of the annual and is not shown by the perennial normally. And uh, in this family four here, we think that there is a single dominant locus segregating that contributes the ability to respond to uh, vandalization at a young age. So it means that during, so we take this to mean that during the evolution of annualism, a gene has evolved in, in an activity in the annual that allows it to bypass this uh, requirement for downregulation microRNA156 and to flower early. And that by mapping uh, we can now use this as genetic mapping material and isolate the gene by standard uh, map-based cloning. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say. I think, that, uh, I think what we've shown is that we can use the Brassicaceae, so this family which has the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana as a system to study the evolution of annual perennialism. And this distinction has arisen several times in the family and we have this robust phylogeny where we can see it's occurred. Uh, 
We think that the timing of microRNA-156, the down-regulation of microRNA-156 com confers competence to flower, uh, respond to vernalization, and that this is a character that's shown by perennials and not by the annuals, the model annuals that we're using. That FLC-PEP1 expression varies between annuals and perennials, and that defines perennial traits such as the restriction of the duration of flowering. And that in natural populations of Arabisulpina, you can find variation for PEP1 activity that we think is important in defining the duration of flowering and is being strongly selected for in uh, southern populations. And then to uh, thank the people who've uh, done this, I'd like to thank uh, Christiana Kiefer, who made the mapping population and really did this cross between the annual and perennial that is going to be, I think, very powerful in looking at the evolution of this trait. Sarah Bergonzi and Marie Albani did the stuff on uh, competence to flower in response to vernalization. Julieta Matthias uh, raised the antibody and did the comparative chip sec. Yubong's been working on SPL15 with Rene Richter. Vicky Tilmas is carrying on with, uh, with the chip sec. And uh, these are our funders. So thanks very much. Will you take questions? I'm sure. Open to the audience. Well, of course, there are difficulties with uh, making perennials and maintaining high yield. So I think that is the, the major issue there, right? So how you would have plants that would live for much longer but also produce the same yield as is associated with annuals. But there are certainly, in theory, advantages in terms of uh, soil erosion, for example. It would only be necessary to sow these plants much less often, and to plow the field much less often. The roots would be much deeper. They should reduce uh, soil erosion. In the cereals, I mean, the control of annual perennials seems to be done differently in that they have a rhizome uh, and the whole shoot dies back into this rhizome which then grows out the following year. So we have interest in the department in looking at uh, annual perennial differences in barley, but uh, it's still at a very early stage. But there's certainly genetic variation for this transition between annual perennial, rather like I described in the Brassicaceae, also in the cereals. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, there's one here. I, I'll give you the mic because it's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, the micro RNA 156, it sounds fascinating. Uh, do you know what changes the abundance of that uh, micro RNA and, um, and, and how does it function uh, to, to change the gene expression? It's, it's, it's two questions, really. Well, I mean, it changes uh, gene expression by binding to the messenger RNA and either preventing the translation of the, micro -RNA, of the messenger RNA or causing the messenger RNA to be cleaved. Uh, <clears throat> how it's downregulated, we do not know yet. So the, Scott Potig and actually another group published a paper, two papers in eLife claiming that in vegetative phase change, so in leaf morphology, the downregulation of micro RNA 156 is caused by the amount of photosynthesis the plant is doing. So it's linked to uh, sugar levels and metabolism. In the case of uh, flowering in the meristem, I really doubt that's the case. Because first of all, it seems to vary between different parts of the plant, different meristems on the, the same plant. And it's not so obvious that they would differ so much in uh, sugar levels to me. And also, it's very, very reproducible and very programmed. Whereas, you know, based on uh, the amount of photosynthesis being done, perhaps the amount of sugar would differ. But this developmental downregulation that we see in the apex is always very standard. So I personally, I rather doubt the, the sugar uh, hypothesis, at least for flowering. And I think it's probably going to be much more to do with the hard wiring of the meristem, perhaps linked to meristem size. But, you know, that's something that we're very much working on, trying to figure out exactly where in the meristem the microRNA is expressed, where it's downregulated. Yeah, you, so. Thanks. 
made my life really easy. I understand that there is an indication that there is a link between um, a season, vegetative season length and the, the occurrence of these two uh, life history strategies, uh, uh, annual plants and uh, perennial plants. Uh, do we have any indication that changes in season length with climate changes uh, induce changes in the occurrence of those two forms? Right. <clears throat> I mean, we have not uh, looked at that at all. So I, mean, I, I guess we would, based on what we saw just from the, the uh, populations of Alpina in different environments, I guess we would predict that if the growing season becomes longer, there would be a stronger selective pressure for uh, an active PEP1 gene. So in that situation, we might see a spread of the active gene. But, you know, I don't know. Nobody uh, tested like transplant experiments, uh, um, well, who that's, wins? That's been done uh, in mimulus, for example, between annuals and perennials. <clears throat> so, but in that case, it's a situation where the annual has a, an ad is adapted to a drought environment and the perennial to a more moist environment. And certainly, if you switch the two, you can show for sure that there's a home advantage. So the annual has a selective advantage in the drought environment with the prediction that it has to overcome this drought through seed. And the perennial is at a disadvantage because it simply has to survive across that period. Yeah, so that type of transfer has been done. Uh, I have a question concerning the light environment. And uh, I observe in the Arabidopsis for a long time that when you cultivate the Arabidopsis in a short photo period, for example, but in a very high light intensity, and still eight hours photo period, they are start to flowering much faster than the Arabidopsis cultivated in a low light intensity. And you observe very clear differences in this, between the Spanish population and Northern Sweden population. And there were no variation in the Spanish population as, I, as far as I... Uh, yeah. save this. And you correlate this with a temperature. However, light variation is a much bigger in the Spanish population than in a Scandinavian population in terms of photons perceived and photons possible to, to, to absorb. So making the long story shorter, the leaves can uh, transform almost 70% of the absorbed light energy into temperature into heat and warm themselves. Have you ever considered this, the, these factors in the, in the regulation of the FT constants and flowering time, vernalization yeah. and, uh, and so on? Um, well, not directly. But of course, what one would like to know there is whether mutants in these genes then respond, affect this type of effect you're seeing under short day conditions. So whether, for example, the photoperiod pathway is activated under your conditions by this type of stress environment. Because of course, there are many other pathways that influence flowering, which I didn't talk about today. I really focused only on the seasonal on the control. And it might well be that what you're seeing under very high light intensities in uh, short days is not to do with the activation of the pathways I talked to today, but much more to do with uh, a stress response that then induces early flowering. You've shown that in basic cases, the um, annuals evolved from perennials. I was wondering how much this could be generalized to other plant families. I think in general that is, uh, it's also what people believe in cereals. <clears throat> uh, I'm not so sure about other families, but I think in general that is the idea that uh, annuals evolved from perennials. I'm running out of energy, so I'm going to have lunch. Yes, <laughs> great. So what I would like to do is thank you for an incredibly illuminating talk about how to link phenotype, genotype and, uh, genotype and environment together in the flowering example. And, and also related out to aging and evolution. I know it's always a work in progress, but 
Thank you very much. Thank Amazing. You.